Oh boy. What I have here in my hand is, as far as I'm aware, the world's brightest and most powerful single unit LED. And as a lighting and LED enthusiast, this is a big deal, it's super exciting. But there's a problem. You see, this uses, wait for it, 1500 watts of power. 1500 watts! That's a huge amount of power and it means just powering this thing on in itself is going to be a huge challenge. And on top of that, it's going to generate a ton of heat and that heat needs to be removed from it, otherwise it's just going to instantly burn up when powered on. Now these two challenges are going to be the focus of this video and hopefully by the end of it we'll be able to see just how bright the world's brightest LED really is. So without further ado, let's get to it. So the first thing I'm going to tackle is making an extreme cooling solution for this. Now unfortunately I can't just use an air cooler as even a colossal one like this is actually only rated for one fifth of the power that this LED kicks out. So it's just out of the question. So I'm going to have to up the ante and use water cooling. Now water cooling is actually used everywhere where a lot of heat needs to be taken away quickly from components and it's sometimes used in computers these days. Now computers use these little water blocks which fit onto processors and take the heat away um, but despite my hunting I can't find one that's big enough to fit on the LED and cool it effectively so I'm going to have to make my own. Now what I've got for this is actually an old server heatsink. Now this is just an air cooler but it's made out of solid copper which means that I can solder to it and hopefully convert it into a water block which can then have water forced through it taking away all the heat from the LED. Now to make this a sealed watertight chamber I'm actually going to use brass sheeting as it can be soldered onto copper. But before I get on with that I need to remove these four screws from the heatsink so that they aren't in the way. This does leave four holes which will obviously be bad news for water tightness but I do have a plan for this which you'll see later. With that done it's time to mark the size and shape of the heatsink onto the brass sheeting and build up my cutting pattern from this for the construction of an outer shell. It's a bit like simple origami though it's obviously more involved as it needs to be cut out with a jigsaw. This does make short work of it though and is now ready to be bent into shape. The use of a hammer is a good way to tighten up the bends. Now this being an outer shell it does need an inlet and an outlet for the water to flow through for which I'm going to use a set of plumbing fittings. These are quite large so the use of a proper metal step bit is necessary to make the correctly sized holes. Before inserting the fittings however I am going to add some flux which is important for the soldering step in just a minute. As these fittings use the British plumbing standard it will be easy to interface them with other fittings later on. So after donning appropriate protective gear it's time to get to work with a blowtorch. As the brass is heated up with the torch the solder flows right onto it and thanks to the flux it gets pulled into any gaps, filling and sealing them as well as joining them together. The charred remains of excess flux is a testament to my lack of experience doing this but once cooled it does appear to have worked to join it together into a single solid unit. Now the intention here is to have the heat sink fitted inside with its base facing outwards but before soldering this in place I am going to tend to its four holes by inserting brass machine screws and keeping them temporarily in place with some nuts. Now I can solder these screws in place which I'm hoping will make a watertight seal around them but we will have to wait until later to see whether this works. So with that done the heat sink can be fitted into the brass shell and it's time to do some more soldering. What's most surprising to me while doing this is how long it takes to get the heat sink up to temperature but I suppose that's a good thing as it shows that it has a decent thermal mass. With the last pieces now soldered into place I'll be the first to admit that it does look like a horrendous mess but after cleaning it up with some wire wool it actually looks almost beautiful and has a vintage charm to it. As far as I can tell the solder joints seem to be making a good seal so so far so good. 
Before mounting the LED to this block though, it's important to add a thin layer of thermal compound to aid in heat transfer between the LED's base and the block. And to hold it in place I'm going to use two little 3D printed brackets. And the reason they're so shiny is because I stuck some aluminium tape onto them, which I subsequently polished for even greater reflectivity. The reason for this is so that they don't absorb any spill light from the LED, which might have otherwise caused them to fail due to becoming soft from the heat. So with the LED now successfully mounted onto the water block, I need to make some sort of water loop so that the water can be pumped through this and take the heat away from it. And for this, I'm using a variety of standardized components so that I can put it together quickly. Now, as you can see, this looks pretty um, ropey, but uh, it's just something temporary so we can test this LED out. And what we've got here is just some large water cooling radiators for computer systems. I've got four of them, and I've got a reservoir and two pumps down here because that will move more water through the system and add a layer of redundancy just in case one fails because this would very quickly break, presumably, if uh, the water stopped flowing. So it's important to have some backup there. Now to loop the LED into this, it's just a case of using the appropriate components and they can just be screwed in like so and then attached to the loop. So with that done, it's now time to fill this with water and see whether the system works and whether the water block is actually watertight because leaks are definitely something that we don't want. So let's get to that. Well, this appears to be working brilliantly and there are no leaks on the water block, which is great news. And this applies even if I block the outward flowing pipe, which means that it's actually dealing with a higher level pressure as the water's being forced in with nowhere to go and yet there are still no leaks. So that's a really good sign and I would say it's quite a success. So with the cooling solution now sorted, it's time to move on to the next challenge in this build, which is actually going to be delivering power to the LED. Now I am going to be powering this from the mains, for which I have got a set of server power supplies that have been wired up in series to give me 2000 watts at 24 volts. Now this has got plenty of wattage at 2000 watts, that's plenty for the LED, but the voltage isn't quite there as the LED needs about 30 volts and this can only deliver 24. So I need to use some voltage boost boards to boost this voltage up. Now, thankfully, the LED has actually been divided into six power sections, making it much easier to drive. And because of this, I've got six of these voltage boost boards, one for each power section. This might seem a little like overkill, as they could technically just about power two sections each, but I'd rather have them run easily at 50% load than have them getting maxed out. Now starting with a single boost board, we can see that its LED section starts to light up at 27 volts, and at 30 volts it's already too bright to look at directly. This really does show off the LED's efficiency, as it is only using 5 watts at this point, and it's going to get 300 times brighter than this. This increase in voltage can be continued until the section reaches its maximum wattage. As the power board features current limiting, a very important thing for LEDs, I can pin this wattage at its maximum of 250 watts, so that the section can never pull more than this and go into thermal runaway. Now it's worth noting that it is actually possible to wire up a slider to control the brightness, but I'll leave this for now until I design a full case for the whole thing. Anyway, with all the voltage boost boards wired up, it's time to finally give this thing a test. Now, I do have a couple of sunglasses on hand because although this isn't anything like a laser, it's still a lot of light coming from a single point, so I might need these just to protect my eyes. So, um, it's a moment of truth. Now, I really do hope that the heatsink's going to keep this cool, so I'm going to continually monitor it as I power on each strip. So let's see how this goes. Strip number one. Wow. So even though this is just one strip, this is already really bright. Can't feel any heat at all on the heatsink, 
but the LED, if I put my hand in front of it, it feels warm. Like I can feel that. That's like a really sunny day and you put your hand out and you can feel warmth from the sun. So strip number two. Strip number three. Okay, now it's getting bright. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but it still feels cool. The heat sink still feels cool. Strip number four. Strip number five. And strip number six. Well, <laughs> dear me. <laughs> like, wow. Oh dear. Like, I can't look at my hand. My hand is reflecting the light back and it's too bright. Even with sunglasses on, it's too bright. Oh dear, I've got to have two pairs on. Wow, that's ridiculous. Oh man, like my hand, oh, it's so hot. Yet the heat sink is cold. That's really good. That's really good. Wow. Okay, the, the power supply is ramping up its fans now, trying to keep up. Oh, that's, that's getting hot. I did not think that a 2000 watt power supply would be getting stressed out by this, but oh, it is. Oh, the fans are ramping up a lot. What's the liquid temperature? Okay, so we've, so we've hit 30 Celsius and this is after about uh, five minutes. According to this, everything, that's the pumps, the fans, the power supply, everything's using 1635 watts of power, which is a lot. Listen to the power supply. <laughs> oh no, it's taking off. Oh, poor little power supply. And it's not even warm. <laughs> it's not even warm. That's superb. The reflector is kind of warm, but not at all bad. Like, it's still pretty cool. I'd say probably about 30 or 35 degrees Celsius. And uh, the actual temperature of the water got up to 31. Then I opened the window and uh, it dropped down to 30. So that's really quite impressive. So the cooling solution is working effectively. And these power supplies have no problem at all. They're, they're barely warm themselves, which is not to be too surprising as they are only working at about 50% load. However, the server power supply is a little bit toasty. Um, it ramped its fans up as you heard to maximum and to my hand it's it's hot so um, that's really the weakest link in the cooling solution but hey it's still within spec presumably so that's all right. Um, now I do want to take this outside and uh, see how it looks at night but before that it is time for a quick ad from Skillshare. An online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including fine art, animation, web development, photography and many more. It's curated specifically for learning with no ads so you can stay focused and they're always launching new premium classes allowing you to explore new interests and stay engaged. Learning and being creative is one of the good ways of looking after yourself and can break up your routine with something that's positive. For me personally, I'm wanting to write a book and having had no previous experience on the matter, I'm finding Daniel Jose Older's classes on Skillshare to be a great foundation and it's a new realm of creativity to explore, so I'm excited to get going. So if you want to explore Skillshare and see what they have to offer, the first thousand of you to visit the link in the description will get a two month free trial of premium membership so that you can explore your own creativity and see where it takes you. Well, uh, I have some rather unfortunate news. I was just trying this out again before taking it outside and then the power supply fans just went crazy, super fast, super loud, turned it off straight away, but there was already kind of smoke coming out of them. And uh, I think they are dead. I'm very, it's hot and I don't really want to try it again. It's within its capability, so the power supply, each of them would be delivering maybe 750 watts each, uh, yet it still basically fried them. So, um, yeah, I am disappointed. It stinks in here, 
and uh, I don't really know what to do. I don't have the time to get another power supply, so unfortunately I'm going to have to leave it there without an outside test for now. But rest assured, I will be revisiting this in the future, in the near future hopefully, and build this into a much better enclosure that is more reliable and can handle it easily. So sorry about that guys, we're just going to have to postpone the outdoor test until I build this into a better enclosure and make a better power solution for it. I'm not quite sure why these failed because they should have been able to deliver the power required but it could be that they are, it's because they're powered in series and that's not technically something you're supposed to do with power supplies but it's something that hobbyists have sometimes done um, and again don't copy this at home. Now the LED is thankfully just fine and the cooling solution worked well to cool it down and I would say that that's a big success. And this is an incredible piece of engineering, um, the LED itself, and I would say massive respect to the manufacturer because this is a unique piece of tech and is incredibly useful for certain circumstances in say commercial installations and maybe studio lighting as it's a lot of light coming from one point which can be useful for mimicking the sun and all sorts of things. And because this is a super high colour accurate um, LED, again that shoves it into another category compared to say stadium lights. This is a unique piece of tech and I'm super impressed by it. Now a big thanks must go out to my patrons as they basically provided all the funds for this project. It's a super expensive project. The water radiators and the water cooling components and all, all these power circuitry, um, it's all added up. So big thanks to you guys, so thanks a lot. And um, the LED itself was sent to me by the manufacturer to test out, so do bear that in mind. Which is a good thing because this is, I think it's $1300. $1,300, so it was a lot of responsibility not to break it, and uh, I'm quite relieved that uh, the cooling solution did manage to work effectively. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, and uh, do subscribe so you don't miss part two of this project, where I'll be building this into a better enclosure and also sorting out a more reliable power solution. And uh, I will hopefully be working with another YouTuber called Max Maker, and the actual original plan was for him to help me make the water block for this. And he made an incredible CAD design that was intended to be milled out of a solid block of copper, but we later decided that this was a bit too complicated and due to the cost of copper it would be very expensive and there would be potential problems to actually milling the thing out and the failures of, of doing that and uh, we just decided that this would be a better method. Um, but he's going to help me make the head for it and the lens system. So that will be cool, so stay tuned for that. But um, I hope you've enjoyed this video otherwise, even though there was a slight failure at the end, the rest of it I'd say is quite a success. So um, yeah, an amazing LED and let's see how bright it is outside when we get this finished off. But other than that, I'm Matt, you've been watching DIY Perks, and I hope I see you next time. Goodbye for now.